this one now. So welcome everybody to today's seminar on net zero heroes emissions reduction in Australia's universities. Our speaker today are Kate Melville Ray and myself, Stefan Arndt. Uh, Kate is a, a former graduate of the University of Melbourne. She did a master of environment a few years ago and did a research project on me on this very same topic. Um, I'm a professor at the School of Agriculture, Food and Ecosystem Sciences, and I'm an ecophysiologist, so I usually study uh, how plants adapt to changes in climate. And I'm coming to you from Nam on Wurundjeri country, and both Kate and I acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which we work and live and play. So now that you know that I'm a um, ecologist, you might ask yourself, Stefan, why are you doing a presentation on uh, emissions reduction in Australia's universities? And so this has something to do with my teaching. Um, so I teach climate change mitigation, which is a subject that runs at the moment. And you can see myself here in front of my class uh, from last Thursday. And in climate change mitigation, the subject, we uh, discuss how do we reduce emissions in society? And then as part of the class, the question got raised, what do universities do in emissions reduction? And so a few years ago, Ben Neville and Rebecca Fowler wrote this uh, pursuit article on how universities can walk the talk on climate action. And they made a really good point about this in this article in that they said, we all have a responsibility to act urgently and universities not only need to talk the talk in terms of emission reduction, but also walk the walk in leading uh, the way on climate action. And we all would have seen this guy, this Duncan Maskell, the Vice Chancellor of the University of Melbourne, and in a address to the Net Zero Australia Interim Findings launch in August 2022, he said, we announced last year that we will be net zero carbon by 2025 and carbon positive in university operations by 2030. So that's a bold statement. And, um, you know, I've been a, uh, director of university campus for about 11 years at the Burnley campus. Um, and the Burnley campus has the advantage that it has one electricity and gas bill. And so as a director who's teaching climate change mitigation, I had this vision, why wouldn't we want to use the University of Melbourne Burnley campus as a case study to get it effectively off the grid? So reduce the gas or get rid of the gas and reduce the electricity costs that we have on campus. So there's a few things I tried to do over my uh, 11 years as campus director. And one of the first ones was that I asked questions around replace gas heaters. Um, and the answer was, well, we can't really replace gas heaters because it's too costly. We have an electric gas heater, uh, electric water, hot water heater, for example. The second one was that I was asking the university if we could install solar panels on campus. And then the solar panel guy sent out a contractor to inform us that we couldn't install solar panels at Burnley because the roofs were all facing the wrong way, which really wasn't the truth. But there was this case, and so we didn't get any solar panels. Then there was a proposal by the university to replace all these old metal single glazed windows that we have. This is the window in my office, and this is how much it closes. And so when they came back and says, here's a quote, it's $4 million, but we want to replace the single glazed windows with other new single glazed windows. I said, well, this doesn't make sense because the R factor and insulation of the building will not change. So how about we go double glazing? And I said, well, that will double the cost and we're not doing it. The last thing was that we then also had a proposal to install a wetland on campus here in this location on the lagoon paddock, which would effectively um, clean the lot of storm water that would come on the campus and then we would be able to use this water for irrigation purposes in the gardens. It's a cost about three hundred fifty to four hundred thousand dollars but the amount of water that we use for irrigation in the gardens would save us about thirty thousand dollars a year so in about 10 to 11 to 12 years we would actually make money out of this action but People came back and says, yeah, that's a good idea, but you now there's not really that amount of pot of money available right now. So three to $400,000 now we're not doing. And then there was this sort of study that we did with another master's thesis with uh, my student, Omar Akadi, who looked at the electricity consumption at the Burnley campus. And so you can see here from midnight to you know, early morning, midday, and then sort of late at night, that's a typical peak that we're getting in an office building. But what you can also see is that we have this very high energy consumption, electricity consumption in the middle of the night. 
So we have consistently high energy electricity consumption there. And so I was wondering, where does this come from? And I asked for, if we can install power meters on campus to figure out, is it the main building? Is it the labs? What is it? Where does it come from? Couldn't be done. So now I had this experience in 10 years of being, or 11 years being campus director, and I really didn't get anywhere. So I asked myself the question, can we really be net zero if we can't actually take any actions here? So this is the motivation for the work that we've done that we present in the seminar. And now you ask the question, why should we even do it? And that's sort of going back to this slide here that talks about the global fossil fuel emissions that keep increasing over time. That's data from the Global Carbon Project, which is an Australian project that measures and predicts the emissions that we have globally in terms of carbon emissions. And we'll find that they've really increased over the last uh, 30 years here consistently. And now they're sort of maxing out a few blips here in the global financial crisis and COVID. But they're really uh, maybe leveling out, but still increasing a little bit. And, and the challenge that we have now in terms of responding to climate change is that we need to go to net zero, which means we need to reduce all of these emissions. So our global emissions are increasing, but really what we need to do is drastically reduce these emissions to get down in electricity generation, transport, buildings, industry, fossil fuel extraction, and so on and so forth. So, that's where we as a university or as an organization would also have to go that we have certain emissions here and they really would need to go down to uh, effectively net zero in whatever time frame we specify. Uh, and now I'm handing over to Kate who will talk about her master's research project. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, universities need to reduce. We've a lot of them have made claims that they either have reduced or are reducing to net zero. Um, so my master's thesis focused on the group of eight universities, um, basically because one, they're, they're seen as like the, the apex institutions in Australia. Um, there are research institutions within Queensland, um, New South Wales, Victoria, South Australia, and Western Australia. Um, and there they are. So basically the aim was to investigate the historical greenhouse gas emissions as well as the net zero strategy. So looking into the past, how have they gone and what are they doing in the future? Next slide. Um, before we get into this, there's a little bit of basically corporate speak that everybody needs to understand. Um, so while for individuals we talk about carbon footprints, they talk about greenhouse gas inventories when it comes to a corporation or an institution. And these get split I mean, when we think of a footprint, we think of an easy outline, but the reality is that actually it's really hard to determine, you know, what are we responsible for and what is somebody else responsible for? Um, so this has been quite tightly, um, basically focused into three scopes. So scope one, these are your emissions owned and controlled directly by the company. These are fossil fuels that you yourself are burning, either, for example, in a car or in a generator in your building. Then after that, you have scope two emissions, and these are the emissions from purchased electricity. So if you live in Victoria, where a lot of our electricity comes from coal, um, your scope two emissions are gonna be a lot higher than in Tasmania. Um, and these two together, we tend to call our direct emissions. We have direct control over how much we produce. Outside of this, we have scope three emissions, also called indirect emissions or supply chain emissions. Um, and these are things that basically a corporation kind of controls. So um, for example, University of Melbourne can theoretically control how many staff flights are taken or who what we invest in or the kind of public transport options or the transport options that staff and maybe even students are taking to work, what we do with our waste, um, what kind of on-campus restaurants we choose to have. Um, so that there is scope three. Next slide. Um, now the Australian government um, regulates that um, all institutions and all, all facilities beyond a threshold are obligated to report their greenhouse gas emissions under what is called the National Greenhouse and Energy Reporting Act of 2007, um, or sometimes called ENGO or ENGO, I've heard many things. Outside of this, uh, um, a whole bunch of different 
basically voluntary institutions that people can choose to disclose their emissions with. Um, this is more with pressure from civil society rather than direct regulation with government. So some of the ones that people may have heard of are Climate Active. The University of Melbourne has plans to work with Climate Active. The Greenhouse Protocol on the very top. This is more like the umbrella branch that has said, this is how you're going to measure your scope one, two, and three emissions. Um, on top of here, there's a few with stars. Race to zero is basically a very chill one of just making a zero pledge. Um, and uh, the Times Higher Education Impact Rankings, Unimel definitely cares about these in terms of ranking you know, one or two in Australia. And they've now got their own little sustainability component within that. Next slide. Um, so group of eight, we have high climate ambition. Some of the you know, quotes that you can pull out with just a simple Google search are things like um, UNSW flicks the switch on 100% renewable electricity, University of Sydney named one of the most sustainable universities, ANU zeroes in on negative carbon emissions, University, on Mel U University of Melbourne on track to achieve carbon neutrality by 2025. Um, and every single group of eight university has pledged to reach net zero or carbon neutral or carbon positive or carbon negative they're all using their own word but basically that you know the zero is the idea of this um unsw since 2020 university of melbourne for scope two emissions so that's our electricity um since 2021 and then we have coming up very very fast in 2025 we have university of melbourne doing scope one two three um anu uq uwa those ones are claiming to the scope one and two not three um, then we have a couple more universities in 2030 and then possibly the laggards, but, you know, we'll, we'll talk about that later. You've got University of Adelaide and UNSW basically saying, well, we're going to do 2050 because that's the national standard. But UNSW has really claimed that they're going to do the full scope one to three in that. Next slide. So here are my results. Um, I basically dug through Australian government data. Um, and put it into pretty graphs. Um, and what you see actually is a bit of a different story to what University of Melbourne would like you to hear is University of Melbourne is also, according to this graph, the most climate polluting university in Australia has been historically um, and continues to be. The, um, just a few interesting things about this graph. Oh yeah, this is only looking at direct emissions. So that's your scope one and two because um, the Australian government does zero recording for scope three emissions. Um, in case you're wondering, I actually extended this graph specifically for this presentation to add it in a couple more years. Um, what you see at that 50,000 tons of CO2 mark is that is where basically the government says, we are not going to disclose the emissions of anything below this threshold. So when I did my research, I reached out specifically to UWA and Adelaide to get that data, but I haven't done that this time which is why you can't see the last two years of theirs. Um, but yeah, you can see a big blip during COVID, especially for the Victorian universities in blue. Um, and possibly, you know, kudos to these unis. They have not gone straight back up to what their emissions used to be. Um, they have kept them kind of at where it was. But overall, when you look at this, you can't really say that emissions have drastically reduced. Certainly, it's a bit odd that here we're, we've, we're saying that the University of Melbourne actually has 120,000 tonnes of CO2 equivalent per year. How does that then work with saying that we're net zero or carbon neutral? Um, so basically, my research digs into this. Um, and here's some of the data that explains where we are a little bit. Um, so campus populations really across the group of eight have been increasing um, until COVID and since then they've plateaued. Then over at energy consumption, as you'd imagine, as population increases, energy consumption as well has been going up. Um, but the great thing for universities, the thing that's really actually helping them to reduce their emissions has nothing to do with the way that they are actually doing much it's that state electricity emission factors are going down so we can see for example victoria one kilowatt hour used to represent over 1.2 tons of co2 equivalent um sorry that might be yeah um whereas now it's below one 
Um, the other side of this, though, what's tricky for Monash and Unimelb is that Victoria still has the most polluting electricity in Australia. So in South, the University of Adelaide, they can actually use three times more electricity than up in Victoria and have the same overall emissions outcome at the end. Um, so yes, University of Melbourne is the most climate polluting university. Um, part of that is because we live in Victoria. Um, next slide. Of course, it's kind of unfair to put these all on the same footing because these universities are very different in size. Um, and so then I looked at it per capita. And what you'll see here is that ANU is just an absolute outlier. Um, a student, so this is staff and students, a full-time equivalent and equivalent full-time student loan. Those load, those are the two that I joined together. Um, and ANU basically has the same facilities as the rest of the group of eight, but with such a small population that the per capita emissions are so high. I think that's part of it. I think another part is that it is quite bleak in um, Canberra. And so they do have higher heating costs than for example, the University of Queensland. Um, and then another thing, you'll sort of see a lot of this plateauing. What I don't have the data for that would be really interesting to see is you know, how many hours are different students and staff actually spending in each. The big assumption here is that like the FTE hours spent on campus is equivalent across all of these campuses. So what would be a better intensity metric, which you know is becoming possible with things like remote sensing, um, is if we could actually do emissions over person hours. So um, if you, for example, think about, sorry, I just saw the chat go off. Um, if you think about counterfactuals here, if for example, a university just has a whole bunch of students at home, then should the university actually be responsible for those emissions of them in their apartment? Um, whereas if they have a super highly efficient classroom where all of these people are actually in this classroom, that actually might be better overall for emissions. Um, so, you know, if anybody wants to do more research, get into people hours. Next, um, we've got mandatory. So I've mentioned this already. We've got the government on the left and we've got the voluntary um, emissions, greenhouse gas inventories on the right. So the next graph I'm gonna show you basically describes what is the university presenting to the government and what are they presenting to the public? Um, and going to the next slide, what you see is that these are so vastly different. So of course, note that scope three is not presented to the government, that is only to the public. So you know, UNSW is probably a great gold standard example here. So that's the third orange one, where you can see that it's exactly the same. The scope one that they're presenting is the same. The scope two that they're presenting is the same. And then they have done the most comprehensive scope three inventory um, as of 20, this is 2019 data, Unimelt has improved since this graph. Um, and so that's kind of what you'd hope it looks like is, okay, they are the same. But what you actually see is just vast differences. So for example, yeah, look at University of Sydney. Um, and another very confusing one was um, ANU. And so the reason for these two is basically because they are using PPAs and they are claiming through basically an electricity offset that they have no electricity emissions. But we'll talk a little bit about that later on. The, the three big things here. So we have scope three emissions across universities are vastly different. Um, number two, we see differences between voluntary reporting and mandatory reporting. And the last thing that I'm gonna to touch upon that doesn't quite show here, but is what I found while doing this are some real blatant errors that are coming out of universities. Um, next slide. So starting with the easiest one, you know, these huge differences where UNSW is claiming much larger scope three than another university, it comes down to what are they counting? So UNSW, they have really done this full inventory um, minus, and this is sort of a discussion that's happening among universities is should we be counting student commuting as part of our scope three emissions? As part of the greenhouse gas protocol, it was really made for like, you know, an end to end products very linear company so imagine nike where it's very obvious and of course they're not going to count the customer coming to the store to buy their shoes but for university um some universities are arguing that we really should be counting student commuting within our scope three emissions 
Um, aside from that, basically it is, it involves a lot of maths and consulting and data collection to do this. So like for University of Sydney, the only purchased goods and services that they considered in theirs was water. For Monash, it was paper and water. Um, this just involves a lot more data collection and it would also be very helpful to have some kind of standardization across universities um, so that we can actually compare them across universities because right now it's really difficult. And the other issue is that they don't like a lot of the universities won't actually explain what they mean. So for example, University of Melbourne, they'll say third party services or equipment. Um, what What is equipment? How you know, robust are these actual measurements? So a lot of questions when it comes to scope three that Stefan will be touching upon more in the second part of this presentation. The another issue, um, possibly controversial that I've called this dodgy electricity emissions accounting, but it's definitely how I feel about it. Um, with the government, it is required that institutions use what is called the location method to count their emissions of electricity. Basically, they take their electricity bill and they multiply this by the average annual emissions factor of their state. So that top line there, that's Victoria. Um, whereas that bottom line there, that is South Australia. Really simple. Um, but what is happening now is that you'll also see the tap again, Stefan. Market method. And market method um, basically means accepting what what corporations are trying really hard to not call electricity offsets, um, but as the simplest term works, not quite as bad as an offset, but similar. Um, it's where, um, for example, the University of Melbourne will sign a power purchase agreement, a PPA with a clean energy supplier. So for example, a wind turbine somewhere in Australia. Um, and, and the lucky thing is that because all of East Australia is technically, and this is when I say technically, I really only mean technically part of the same grid. So they can get, for example, solar panels in Queensland, even if you are in Victoria. And then after that, the electricity that actually comes back to your company or your university is has not changed. It's still exactly what it is in the state. Um, but the claim is, well, we have added this much extra renewable energy to the grid. Therefore, we can claim that we actually use that electricity and not what we actually use. Um, so that's part of the problem. And what this means is that the market method, and I probably shouldn't say allows, I should say the market method um, means we're, we're making claims like this, but I actually don't know if these are all totally legal. Um, so ANU, they say ANU benefits enormously from our location in the ACT, which means we are using 100% renewable electricity. So this is because the ACT has actually signed power purchase agreements across Australia. Um, but the reality, the actual kilowatt hours going into ACT are no different from the kilowatt hours going into New South Wales, um, because this is more of like an offset scheme. Um, same with University of Sydney, powered by 100% renewable electricity, UQ, to set world standard with 100 100% renewable energy. Um, I'm going to show you a slightly better version that is in the most recent University of Melbourne sustainability report. This is more realistic. They say by voluntarily re retiring 49,575 renewable energy certificates, which is kind of like the um, kilowatt hour offset equivalent, um, sourced primarily from our wind power, wind farm power purchase agreements, we ensured that 64% of our total electricity consumption was from renewable sources. Um, now the cut, the sentence I cut just before this is saying University of Melbourne is net zero in scope one and two. Um, but you can see here, actually they only purchased 64% through PPAs. The other bit was um, offsets from like Indonesian um, hydro plants, et cetera. Um, so that's another question then. But the problem about saying, for example, that, you know, you've bought one of these kilowatt hour, renewable kilowatt hours, is that PPAs ignore timing. And timing is everything in today's world of renewable energy, where, you know, one kilowatt hour that you produce at noon on a sunny day is not the same value as something you produce when the sun has gone down and there's no wind going. That is when we, we're actually pumping up fossil fuels. So an average power purchase agreement, if you actually look at what's being sucked up most of the kilowatt hours are coming from that daytime when we have too much energy and there's still this lack you're still using fossil fuels at other times um so most research 
I should mention this is from the US. So for Australia, it would look the opposite. It would be red on the center during um, winter time. Um, but basically, yeah, the, the current laws are that as long as your annual amount of kilowatt hours that you use is equivalent to the annual kilowatt hours of renewables that you are buying, then you can claim your net zero despite still using about 40% fossil fuels. There's no storage incentive. There's no flex incentive. Um, the other side of this, there's there's a quite a simple solution, and it's that we need granular matching. And UNSW has looked into this. Um, and what this means is if you use 10 kilowatt hours at 3 p.m. on a Sunday, you have to guarantee that you are getting three kilowatt hours, so 10 kilowatt hours at 3 p.m. on a Sunday of renewable energy. And then this gives you storage incentive. That gives you flex incentive. Next slide. Um, in Australia, it's not really being talked about yet, but for example, in Europe, this is becoming um, a much bigger issue where um, the first one, renewable energy certificates threaten the integrity of corporate science-based targets. Um, and the second one, electricity firms told to drop false 100% green power claims. Um, this is becoming really bigger in Australia as well with hydrogen now, where green hydrogen claims are being made with PPAs. And so there are now pushes to make sure that we're actually talking about what we call 24 seven. So like time-based PPA claims. Um, this is a, you know, a risk for the universities as well. They could end up facing these greenwashing claims. Getting almost to the end of my presentation. First, I wanna end with some of the honestly horrific errors um, that I have found. So this first one here, um, was I think 2020 to 2021 reporting, um, ANU underreported their greenhouse gas emissions by 80% in 2021 to the government. Um, the government did not question the data. And what this did is because they were under that threshold of that initial graph that I showed, it meant their data was just missing from all government reports. Um, so it wasn't until I contacted ANU and said, what happened that I received this? and basically came back to them and said, hey, you've misreported your data to the government. Um, and they said they'll do something about it, but actually if you go into the government, you, it's, it's still the same, it hasn't been updated. Next one, um, the University of Sydney, they have just skipped three zeros in their STARS reporting. So this ranks universities on their sustainability. Um, they've gotten a silver status, but they've missed the killer in killer time. Um, and because of this, they're claiming that they only had six metric tons of scope one and 86 instead of 86,000 metric tons of CO2 equivalent in their scope two. Um, this has also not been fixed since I did my research two years ago. Um, so I think, you know, neither of these were done on purpose. I think it's just that Australians are not good at maths. Um, so we need to uh, improve our mathematical literacy um, but also it's it's quite scary in that, you know, if if the government is not cross-checking any of this work, even when it's blatantly, obviously incorrect, um, what happens then when a corporation actually wants to fudge their numbers? Um, so it's not giving me much hope with any kind of accreditation scheme or government monitoring scheme. Um, so it's on that bleak note, I have sort of, I've got three problems and three solutions. So first problem, universities are not really reducing emissions in real terms fast enough. So yes, they're buying offsets. Yes, they're doing PPAs. But what we saw from that government data is that our actual, you know, what we're using electricity wise, um, it's not going down much. And when we're not moving to more like, um, our emissions, our energy efficiency factors are not going down fast enough. So for example, switching from gas boilers to electric boilers. Um, so th that just focus more on carbon mitigation hierarchy. So that is your, it's, it's the same as your waste. You wanna avoid, then you wanna reduce, you wanna use um, things like PPAs only when you need to. Next one, lax power purchase agreement laws allow untrue 100% renewable electricity claims. So I've already talked about the solution to this as well. We need to switch to what is called granular 24-7, 100% renewable energy. Um, Google and Amazon and some of the big tech companies have already agreed that this is what they're going to do. UNSW is 
looking into it right now. Um, I think that this, some governments in Europe are requiring this for corporations to actually say that they run on renewable energy. They're saying you have to do 24 seven renewables. I think that there's a role here for civil society as well as government um, to get this one to happen. And last but not least, Australian governments, Niger, Niger, Niger it's incredibly underwhelming um, to put it lightly. So the things that I would like to see is the disclosure threshold of 50,000 tons is what it is right now. I think it needs to go to 10,000 kilotons um, because, and to put that's still quite high. In Vietnam, it's about 3,000. Um, and that is basically because all we're seeing right now is data from six Australian universities of what, about 40? Um, so it means all the good players are just being erased from the data. Um, and then the other side of that is that we should be allowing institutions to voluntarily disclose under this scheme. So if an institution, an organization wants to actually have their data publicly available there to basically point the fingers to the bad guys up top, they should be allowed to be within that data. Um, or, and this is what the UK is doing, we should be following the UK model, what they call higher education statistics agency. This is what I hope for. I hope that, you know, the research that I did becomes completely redundant um, because we will just have a website that is publicly available where every single university um, has all of this information just posted side by side by side and you can control by what year, um, location, geography. And this is only just a small snippet of the amount of information that they are required to disclose. Um, so yeah, that's, that's my dream is basically more tables with numbers. Um, and I'm going to pass it back to Stefan to continue with more research. All right. Thanks, Kate. So the next step of this uh, presentation now looks into uh, all of Australian universities. And this was another uh, project, research project, Master of Environment project by Nick Thornley, who was one of my students in the class. And uh, he came to me, uh, heard about Kate's analysis and said, well, what else can we do? And I said, well, let's look into the scope three emissions reporting of all 41 universities in Australia. And he then went to try to find the official emissions reports, assess university web pages and their sustainability reports on emissions data and or write to the universities and ask for emissions data. So next tables that you'll see that there will be some universities that have been named and many universities will not be named. So we've anonymized all the non-public data emissions data that came through. So 13 universities only had publicly reported data in 2019. 12 universities responded to Nick's email and sent us data. Two universities provided data other than 2019 because they didn't have them for that year, but the subsequent one, four universities came back and said that they didn't have any data for 2019 and 10 universities just blatantly didn't talk to us. And uh, so a quarter of all the universities just didn't bother to respond. So how do the data look like? And, and this is now, you know, graphs look like this and they're a bit confusing or maybe a bit, bit busy here, but this is the absolute, so the absolute amount of scope, one, two, and three emissions. So everything blue in here is the direct emissions from gas, in orange, the uh, scope two emissions, so electricity, and the gray ones here are the scope three emissions that are reported in terms of absolute emissions, tons of CO2. And so what we'll find from this, you know, going with University F down to the Australian National University and everything in between, we'll find a huge variation in there. University of New South Wales, as we've heard from Kate, they are the ones who are doing probably the most diligent reporting in terms of scope three emissions. But what we'll see is that scope one and two emissions across the university sector is really dominant. So it's not only the group of eight universities that are doing that, it is actually all universities in Australia having this focus on scope one and two emissions and scope three emissions are not really well reported. So if you look at the scope three emissions in Australian universities, and this is a smaller number of universities that have reported this, and again, apologies, some universities are just called University F because they didn't want us to disclose their name publicly, so we're not doing that. Um, but for some of them, you can kind of work out who they are. But if we look at the scope three emissions, again, University of New South Wales has the massive emissions here, but a lot of the other universities are just not reporting that many categories. Um, and the magnitude overall across universities is just fundamentally different. 
Uh, now, this is a breakdown of the absolute scope three emissions data. So we put everything on the 100% and then say, well, what's the relative emissions here? And you can see that business travel seems to be really dominating that light blue color here is what most universities are actually reporting. So all 21 universities in this list had business travel reporting. So worried about academics flying all over the world to conferences and elsewhere. And that is a large emissions factor for some universities. It's the only one like RMIT here for others like ANU, they just have waste and they have business travel and that's it. So in waste, this yellow color here is also one that pretty much most universities are reporting on. But you have very few universities that report on more categories. University of New South Wales is one of them. Then University J is also one that has reports in more categories. Um, and then uh, University of Western Sydney uh, also had a few more categories there. Um, so then we thought, okay, let's compare that to other universities across the globe. So in this case, the United States and the United Kingdom and see what they're doing. So this seems to be odd that, you know, Australia is just not reporting that much university uh, scope three emissions. So it's just something that all universities do. And you'll find that there is a bit variation here in the uh, US universities, the five that we picked from, from their list. Uh, but there is a bit more homogeneity in the UK university. So if we put this on relative scope one, two, and three emissions here, again, blue one is the scope one, so direct gas emissions, it's electricity emissions, and the gray ones here are the scope three emissions. Big variation in the United States, very similar to what we have in Australia, but in the UK, much more uniformity there. In that all of these universities seem to have a similar amount of direct emissions, electricity emissions, and then 80 5% or so of the emissions are actually scope three. Um, and so this then begs the question, well, if the UK is doing this and sort of 85%, what's the emission factor that they have? And we were interested in what is the real or probably emissions in scope three emissions from Australian universities. So we did this by looking at the population data for Australian universities, then took the average scope three emissions intensity per university population. So how much emissions did we have per FTE or FTSO in the university based on the University of New South Wales and the five UK universities? And they averaged out about seven tons per person. And this was pretty uniform across the board for both of these um, entities, so universities with as well as and the five uh, UK universities. And then we multiplied the university population in Australian universities by 7.01 to predict the scope three emissions for each Australian university. And this is how it looks like in this case, the blue bits are the reported emissions uh, for Australian universities and the orange bars are the predicted ones. And then you can see the whole scape really changes, the landscape changes in that the university emissions are actually much, much larger for all of them. University of Melbourne, you can see now, big uh, indirect emissions from scope three. Um, and the same is true for effectively all universities that have reported something other than University of New South Wales. So if you sum it up, universities in Australia actually only reported about probably 13% of the what we call the likely scope three emissions uh, that they have. So what is the consequence of this under reporting here? So we then made an assumption and saying, okay, well, what's the reported scope three emissions for the Australian universities, which was 890,000 tons of CO2. What would be the predicted ones which is almost 10 times bigger, about 8 million tons of CO2. And then we said, okay, if they're all offsetting these emissions, how much does that cost? And so we assumed an offset cost of about 20 Australian dollars per ton, that would cost Australian universities $160 million. If the offset cost would increase to $100 per ton, which is likely by 2030, because what a um, organization is doing, they need to be net zero, so they don't really want to change anything. So they're just buying the emissions offsets. So emissions offset costs will go up because everybody wants to buy them. That's relative simple economics. So we end up with having a bill of about $800 million. And if the offset cost then double uh, in the 10 years after that, we'll be at 1.6 billion. So there's a lot of money that Australian universities would have to pay to be net zero. So we looked at that for University of Melbourne. What would that look like? We've reported about 80,000, but our likely scope three emissions are probably more like 450. So this would cost us about $9 million if a ton of CO2 is about 20 bucks. It would be $45 million if uh, this cost increases to $100. So a significant 
financial burden then for the university. So key results here is that we didn't really have a consistency in the scope three emissions reporting among Australian universities, that scope three emissions for so the indirect emissions are significantly underreported in Australia. And this is a potential substantial scope three emissions liability burden if we really want to pay for it. Now we ask the question, why is this re emissions reporting so inconsistent here? And uh, I pick a case study from the University of Tasmania, which is certified net zero by Climate Active. And we look at the sort of carbon neutral certification of the University of uh, Tasmania's um, uh, paperwork there. And you can see that to achieve carbon neutral certification, organizations must measure and reduce emissions. And here's the kicker where possible. So this is possible because Climate Active actually has no mandatory reporting guideline for scope three emissions, which means that universities can choose which scope three emissions they are reporting and then they have to offset these emissions. So there's no mandatory guideline that says, here's the list, that's what you have to report against. So what does it look like in terms of University of Tasmania? They had a fair amount of uh, reports on waste, uh, that they had general waste, recycled waste, and so on. A little bit of capital works, not a huge amount of, of emissions there. And then the purchase goods and services. So anything that the university would buy in terms of computers, office furniture, anything, they just report office paper and tissue paper. So that makes me think about the poor people working at the University of Tasmania sitting there in their empty offices because obviously they haven't bought any furniture, they haven't bought any computers, but they have to use a lot of tissue paper because that's also sad. Uh, but then of course, they're also reporting a lot of air travel and, and other travel there. If you compare this reporting, which of the University of Tasmania, which is certified net zero with UNSW, you can see what a complete reporting that actually looks like where you go through all the categories in um, the greenhouse gas protocol from category one purchase goods and services, which is 157,000 tons of CO2 in University of New South Wales in 2019 down to investments. So that's a much more comprehensive uh, way of reporting. But, and I like to point this out, Kate mentioned this before, student travel and student commuting is still not included in this. Why is this important? Is This is the average emissions of all UK, UK universities in 2018-19. So this is the uh, report that Kate mentioned earlier. The Higher Education Statistics Agency in the UK requires all 161 universities in the United Kingdom to report emissions. That's what the split looks like. So scope one and two of the direct emissions from gas emissions and electricity emissions is only about 16% of the emissions of university in the United Kingdom. About 20%, almost 18% is student flight. So this is students coming to the UK. They count that, we will not. Construction is about 17%, business services, business travel, student commuting, and so on and so forth. So we'll find that generally we have a massive underreporting problem here. Other countries like the UK have this organized through reporting requirements through their HESA uh, organization. And that puts every university on a, on a uh, equal platform there. So summing this up, the universities in Australia are not counting all relevant emissions. The main focus here in this country is really on scope one and two, and they ignore many relevant scope three emissions. There are no clear guidelines how universities should count emissions. So because there's no guidelines, the universities do what they think is best or works best for them. There's also an issue that the greenhouse gas protocol standard, the gold standard that we talked about, is not customized really for universities. So Student commuting or student travel is not really included in this 15 categories there because um, it is not really the business model that was built upon. And the Australian Net Zero certification is flawed because it doesn't count all the emissions. It allows organizations to simply pick and choose which emissions they want to report. Um, and this flawed Net Zero certification is then, of course, this incentivizing organizations to actually reduce emissions. Uh, so. As universities, I would have thought that we're operating within the rules that we give that we we've been given, but probably should we have a higher standard in operating? And I had this sort of emissions mitigation hierarchy, which I took from a global mining review. I thought this would be very fitting that the mining industry actually has worked this out. So usually you would start off with avoiding emissions by designing emissions out before they actually happen. You would eliminate them then through step changes, that means you're phasing out gas, you're making buildings more 
energy efficient, then you would reduce um, the emissions by improving the efficiencies and reduce energy consumption. And then at the last step, you would purchase carbon offsets. But that's not how we're operating at the moment because uh, a lot of these steps are even not being taken by universities. So we have a lot of work to do in this area and the sort of significant emissions reductions of our operations, I think in my experience and what we've seen so far is really still lacking. Um, so I've asked this question at the beginning of this talk, can we really be net zero if no actions are taken? And now we know, yes, we can, we can be net zero, uh, but if we want to be, it would actually be very costly, at least in the future. University of Melbourne would look at costs of about $10 million and then that would increase to about $45 million and probably by 2030. Uh, and this would also mean that we still be net zero only on paper, but not in reality. So I guess one of the things as the last point in this presentation is, should we really focus on net zero or should we as universities have a rethink of net zero? So would it be meaningful or useful to focus on the emissions reduction that are actually meaningful? So reduce the scope one emissions totally. You have no gas, have no vehicles. And that is something I've been told University of Melbourne is working towards. So we have now a pot of money that says, okay, if you have a gas boiler for hot water, we'll replace it with an electric one. That's great. There's also a tendency of what we should be doing probably is focusing on just usage. So have greater energy efficiency of buildings and new buildings that we're building there and reduce scope three emissions where we can but not have this obsession that we have to reduce all of them because many of these top three emissions are outside of our control. And we're running a new student project with Jeremy Tang and the sustainable unit where we look exactly at that. Where can we reduce scope three emissions in our university operations right now? Um, and what, what is possible and what is not possible? And then probably given, you know, as a leading university in Australia, Maybe we should have a uniform approach across all universities where we can then say, this is what we as universities are doing, rather than possibly focusing on this more greenwashing approach on that zero. And I'll end it here. Thank you very much. And uh, I'll open this up uh, for questions. So if you have any questions, then please raise your hand and Kate and I would be happy to try to answer them wherever we can. There's a lot of stuff going on in the chat, uh, Kate. I'm not sure if you had a chance to, to look at it, uh, but maybe we'll field some of the questions beforehand. So Tim, uh, what is your question? Hey guys, thank you for a really um, insightful talk and important. Um, uh, there were two things that I had in my mind that I wonder if you could talk about. One is the effect of the investments that universities hold and whether there's any chance of those being factored in to the um, to the CO2, um, the, well, just the, let's say the planetary consequences. The other one is the effects of the research, because I often wonder, you know, when universities do research, they say, let's, um, we've got research that can reduce the emissions of this fossil fuel by X. I think probably, ultimately, just by entrenching fossil fuels as the norm, even doing that research, the net effect is probably actually worse than if you just said, look, let's, let's put no research into fossil fuels and divert all of that into some CO2 neutral energy. So, so the, uh, the effect of what the research um, output is. Cheers. I, I can answer the first part of that. Um, so yes, within scope three, number 15 of greenhouse gas protocol is investments. So they do look at them. Um, UNSW actually did this and they, they did their whole greenhouse gas, um, oh my goodness, um, emissions disclosure. And then something like 70% of their scope three was just their investments. So what they did, they were like, easy win, we divest and we can claim that we've reduced our scope three by like 20, 70%, um, which is also possibly a little bit untrue. Um, but yes, it's, it's part of um, scope three and a, an easy win for a university to make a very easy claim into re having reduced their scope three emissions. Um, in terms of research, that's something that I think we are trying to do to understand better where do our scope three emissions in the university come from and what can we actually do to reduce them. So are there uh, ways by changing procurement, uh, changing suppliers? Uh, um, is there opportunities to reduce the emissions there? Um, and that's a tricky one because it's it, it does a deep dive into the 
um, the categories in terms of scope three that we have. Um, Amy, that maybe Amy or not Amy, it's probably not uh, Amy. Hi, my name's Ben, I'm not Amy. Um, yeah, that was a really nice talks, both of you, thank you. Um, and I think what you exposed really clearly was that there's, there's no incentive, there's actually a disincentive for comprehensive reporting and there's, there's actually an incentive for even a bit of like, you know, fudging or, or blunders, like that was just, I'm almost like just laughable that that could actually happen. Now, I was just wondering about um, the that UK system. I mean, it's one thing universities definitely do is compete with each other. And if we could somehow get a scheme that where universities wanted to be better than the other in inside a formal scheme of some sort, but that that UK scheme does that actually. You know, is that report, is that a, a model for us? I mean, um, how does it work? And are the universities in the UK kind of competing against each other to be the best in that scheme? Um, yes and no. I mean, this was a mandatory, and Kate, you can answer this as well, but it is a mandatory requirement for the universities to report on their admissions. And initially they did have certain targets in there as well that would lead to the reduction in, in their emissions that they reported then. And they found out this to be incredibly difficult. And I think we as a university found that as well in our sustainability reporting is that, you know, we, we set ourselves a target and then it's hard to achieve it or we're not achieving it. So I think the UK universities in the HISA system have actually have walked, walked away from uh, this sort of having clearer guidelines of saying we want to be, you know, 20% reduction by... 2028 or something like this. Um, but no, it's a, it's a government requirement to, to have the reporting there. Kate, you want to add to this? The only thing I'd add is that the equivalent in Australia would be if TEFMA took it over. So that's the Tertiary Education Facilities Management Association. Um, it's like he, HESA is kind of under the equivalent of that, but they just do a lot more than TEFMA does currently. Thanks, Forbes. Thank you very much, Stefan. Thanks, <clears throat> Kate. Um, great talks. Uh, so, yeah, I, I think you've covered what I particularly want to talk about was those guidelines, and it sounds like there is the opportunity to, to learn a great deal from the UK colleagues and, and universities. And my experience is more in the world of healthcare and um, how that is slowly changing as well. Have a read of the Medical Journal of Australia article we had about hospitals. Victoria is interesting in that, we, you know, even though Victoria has one million fewer people um, in the state of New South Wales, we burn more energy than all of the state New South Wales hospitals because of um, gas in winter in particular. Uh, and of course, then there's brown coal. Um, the other interesting thing is I, I see universities suffering away from the same problem with scope three as hospitals and healthcare in general. Um, the input output data is a bit tricky when you come to the imperfect market that exists in, in healthcare. What I mean by that is that you get away with some very expensive toys and technology and drugs and things like that that have nothing to do with the real carbon footprint of what they are and much more about how much profit you can make from them because there's monopolies and duopolies and those sorts of things. And I imagine the same sort of headaches exist in university, when, particularly in scientific instrumentation, et cetera, where you may have new monopolies and duopolies in the price of things. So I just, you know, obviously paper and things like that are fairly straightforward. They're much more perfect markets, but imperfect ones are tricky. I don't know if you want to comment on that. Yeah, I, I I agree with you on this. Uh, scope three is just inherently very difficult, and our analysis and the other analysis shows us how big the emissions are that come from scope three. But many of these emissions are not under our direct control, and they're also unavoidable. I mean, if we're building new buildings, there will be emissions associated with them. We have to have computers, we have to have office <coughs> furniture, and so on. And so there might be supply chain wins that we can have by moving to a different supplier, possibly, or using a different product. That's one thing that we're investigating at the moment, but um, it, it still will be an emission that is there. And the other question is, and that's more of a you know really deep dive research question is, should we own this uh, scope three emissions, yes or no? And that is the one that we don't have an yeah. answer to, uh, because somebody's scope three emissions will be somebody else's scope one and two emissions, right? So that's a, that's a tricky one, I think, for people that have delved deeper into the nature of scope three emissions to figure out really is, is the emissions accounting 
correct. Because uh, Ben mentioned this before, there isn't this incentive to actually do a full accounting because then all of a sudden your emissions are so big. And then if you want to be net zero certified, then that's a real financial burden on you as a university. Okay, yeah, we might find you know, five or $10 million, but we have to pay $45 million every year to have that accreditation. I think that's a problem to justify. Uh, you know, how many professors uh, can we employ for like $45 million? <laughs> uh, two or three, maybe. Um, all right, thanks, Forbes. And Ben, a question or a comment? Thanks, thanks, both, um, yeah, both Stefan and, and Kate. Great work, and and so my, my question kind of does actually segue on on from that, and and that's um uh, around what insights you may have had uh, with looking at UNSW, particularly who've gone down the science based targets uh, approach, whereas we've gone down the climate active approach, and um, you know we, you know our 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 choice was you know very political at the time, and and you know totally understand was it's difficult to get people on board, so you just do what you can, you know when you can, and um, but I think with um you know, the coming up to the 2025 target, I think um, there, there might be the opportunity for us to, well, I'm suggesting there's an opportunity for us to maybe jump over to the science-based targets um, uh, if, if it is perceived to be um, superior, especially when, you know, if we've got a, a $9 million bill that is going uh, to offsets of which, you know, the vast majority probably are pretty dodgy, right? We, we could do much better things with that $9 million potentially in-house you know, in terms of actually reducing our own, own carbon emissions. Um, so did you, uh, yeah, what, what, any insights into the, you know, science-based targets versus climate active? Hey. I'm a little bit biased because I work for WWF now, which started SBTI. Um, I would say like the big issue with SBTI is the fact that it was also was not made for universities. It's still made for corporations. Um, so I think there are some like learning difficulties there in, um, you know, just, just like greenhouse gas protocol. Um, but yes, I, I really do support it in terms of, for example, promoting insetting over offsetting um, and, and those little things like that. Um, and climate active. I mean, we've looked into it. It's, not amazing. Yeah. Um, Chris Dixon. Yeah. Hi. Thank you. Great presentation, um, Kate and Stefan. Really love that. So I've just come to the university. I'm actually working in the sustainability team now to work on pretty much everything you just spoke about. Mm -hmm. um, and so fantastic. I've worked with Climate Active for several years and fully agree. It's um, it's an imperfect program. And I can tell you if you've ever had to work with their calculators, they're imperfect too. Uh, um, just because they're constantly understaffed but point be told i guess in this piece i had one question i put it in the chat but two one was just with this carbon uh, sorry net zero are you simply referring to unis going for carbon neutrality or net zero itself which are two distinctly different categories carbon neutral being you just offset everything net zero being sbti aligned hitting 90 percent reduction with neutralization by yeah, of the last 10 percent by 2050 um so is this are these really just looking at the uh, carbon neutral aspects of the universities or net zero claims as well? I think part of it is we kind of have to simplify because every university is using their own lingo. Um, yeah. So like, yes, the, the whole idea is, like you said, if a university is saying they are net zero, they should be following what you just said. Um, mm. So that's probably an extended talk. We'll talk about, well, what is net zero and which universities should stop using this term? Yeah, no, fair, fair. No, it's an interesting thing because we found there was lots of confusion across many different sectors and industries. So I was just wondering whether these were the universities making carbon neutral claims, but just using wrong terminology, or whether some had literally set these very ambitious net zero ones, which I was like, that's, as you said, if you start taking uh -oh. investments in, huge. <laughs> so UNSW has definitely said net zero by 2050 for scope one to three. Okay, fantastic. That's one that's definitely said that. Yeah. All right. No, thank you for that. Um, all right, well, one more question uh, from Robin, and then we'll probably have to uh, call it quits. And a quick one to Stephanie, who asked a question about whether we can use the emissions factors from UK universities in Australia 
It were they were the same in the UK universities in respect of per person uh, compared to UNSW, and because they were almost identical, that's why we just were I we thought we can justify we use them to predict scope three emissions in Australian universities. All right, last word, Robin. What's what's your um, fabulous fabulous talk? It's very exciting. Um, questions were: um, Is there an opportunity here to lead? Um, so Melbourne, you need to lead and what would that look like? How are you publishing this work? How can we make this happen? Well, I, I do think that, um, and, you know, uh, Jared put this in the chat as well, University of Melbourne has changed their, the way we, for example, count scope three emissions. And I think we are genuine sort of the desire in the sustainability team now to actually do uh, better than we have done a few years ago. Um, so I, I would think that we are actually leading the way at this point in time, um, I guess the question is really what are the the consequences from this leadership uh, for the other universities in Australia? Because I have to admit I was reasonably shocked and disappointed by the level of engagement of Australian universities in emissions reporting in general. That there is no consistency. That you know, ten universities don't didn't even seem to think if they've done anything. If you check their web pages, many of them don't even have sustainability units that do this kind of reporting. And so it does probably call for a lobbying a bit higher up to say, well, let's have my, or somebody else to actually do proper reporting and set the guidelines of what that's what we have to report. So at least we understand what the emissions are. And then we as universities, there's a sort of leading thinkers in the country can't do that, then I think we have a problem. So I, I would hope that at some point we would get that. All right, well, I would like to thank everybody. I have to call it quits now, it's one minute past one. So thanks a lot, everybody, for these great questions, very engaged audience. Uh, there's a paper coming by Kate. We have it almost accepted now by a journal. And Nick's thesis is also in the making now. We hopefully can uh, submit this for publication soon. But thanks, everybody. And I'll see you next week for Luke Kelly's talk on fire in the Anthropocene. Thanks, and bye-bye.